I was raised to believe that the Bible is a book of morals, that it defines good versus evil for us within its pages. In the Garden of Eden, however, there were two trees. The tree that brought death was the tree that contained the question of morals, good versus evil. The other tree was the tree that brought life to all the aid of its fruit, the tree of life. Is it possible that we've been asking the wrong questions, chasing the wrong thing by seeking to be moral? Let's run an experiment. Rather than seeking to define and live by good versus evil, let's flip the question. Let's define life instead. But to do that, we must first seek it out. So join us as we dare Shkai, as we seek life. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Derish Chai, the show where we take the Bible and we try to find the things of life within it. And even more than that, we try to bring the Bible to life. Well, this week we begin what would be a new Parsha if we were in the one-year cycle. It's taken us 20 episodes to get this far, and today we begin what is the fifth Parsha of the one-year cycle. What would have normally taken five weeks if you can go through the one-year cycle has instead stretched out to nearly five months. And what a blessing it has been for me to be able to slow down and to really marinate in the text each week and to pray. And I pray that it's been a blessing for each of you. Uh, for the past ten weeks, we've been primarily focused on Avraham. We begin his story back in Genesis 12, and we've explored in depth the various aspects of Avraham's character and the ways in which he interacted with the world. The snapshots that we've been given of Abraham's life have revealed to us the character and the challenge that we will all face, all of us who are the seed of Abraham. As a reminder, Galatians 3.7, know then that those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. If you are of the faith of Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham. And as we saw, Abraham didn't always act properly. He didn't always live perfectly. And the fact is that Abraham was a fallen human, just as each one of us is. And during all of Abraham's trials and all of his adventures, there's been someone else in the background. There's been someone who has borne the burdens of Abraham, and perhaps borne even more than Abraham. And yet, this someone is not given a whole lot of credit. She constantly remains in the background, and unfortunately, as is usually the case, the one in the background doing all the work, the unsung hero, is not truly appreciated and honored until they're no longer there. And I believe that's what this chapter shows us. Because this week we're talking about Sarah, the wife of the great patriarch, the woman behind the man. She was forced to suffer the indignity of being taken into the household of other men. She was the one who was barren and mocked and suffered for the sake of her inability to bear an heir. She's the one who, when she finally did have an heir, she did not experience a break in the mocking and the laughter of those who were around her. She's the one who followed Abraham, and she cleaved to him, and she was his other half. She was the one who completed this great father of Israel. This woman is usually held up as an example of what not to do in the stories that were told of her, and yet, without her, the promise would never have reached its fulfillment. Because she is a woman of strength and honor, and yet, do we ever read of her being honored? When she is honored, does she recognize it as such? Well, this week the uh, chapter begins with Chaya Sarah, which translates as the life of Sarah. And these few chapters of Genesis that mention Sarah have several items of interest, and they paint for us a picture of Sarah and her life, if we congeal them all together and look at them as just her story her hardships and her challenges, so we might just find that her story is one that many of us can relate to. So let us do as Abraham does in this chapter. Let's honor Sarah, the matriarch of the promise. So let's go ahead and let's read Genesis 23. Genesis 23, And Sarah lived 127 years, the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kiryat Arva, that is, Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Then Abraham rose up from beside his dead and spoke to the sons of Chet, saying, I am a foreigner and a sojourner among you. Give me property for a gravesite among you, so that I bury my dead from my presence. And the sons of Chet answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my master, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial sites. None of us withhold from you his burial site from burying your dead. 
So Avham rose and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Chet. And he spoke with them, saying, If it is your desire that I bury my dead from my presence, hear me, and approach Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me. And let me have the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of his field. And let him give it to me for the complete amount of silver, as property for a burial site among you. And Ephron dwelt among the sons of Chet, and Ephron the Chetite answered Abraham in the hearing of the sons of Chet, all who entered the gate of this city, saying, No, my master, listen to me. I shall give you the field and the cave that is in it. I shall give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I shall give it to you. Bury your dead. And Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If only you would hear me, I shall give the amount of silver for the field. Take it from me, and let me bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My master, listen to me. The land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Chet, four hundred shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. Thus the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Chet before all who went in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarai, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, that is, Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Thus the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Chet as a property for his burial site. So, who was Sarah? What do we really know of her? Frankly, not much. I'm going to do something a little different in this teaching the, than I usually do. I'm going to ask each of us to try to put ourselves in Sarah's place, to use our imagination for a moment, to take what we do know from Scripture, and then to speculate a little bit, taking what we do know and extrapolating from it things that we don't necessarily know. I think that too many times when we look at these early characters, these heroes of the faith, we elevate them to a status of greater than human, uh, people who are more than simply people. And in truth, we aren't told a whole lot of Sarah. And yet the stories that we are told, they do help us to perhaps see this woman as a woman, a person with emotions and expectations and hope and dreams, a fully realized person that we could identify with. So let's take a few minutes and let's build a profile of Sarah and let's put on her sandals for a moment and learn of this woman of greatness. So I ask again, what do we know of Sarah? Well, we know from both Sarah and Abraham's testimony that Sarah was the half-sister of Abraham. If we turn back to Genesis 11, we may, and I stress may, catch a bit of Sarah's history in verse 29. In Genesis 11:29, it says, And Abraham and Nahor took wives, the name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Yiska. Now, according to Rashi, he's a Jewish sage, according to Rashi, Yiska is Sarah, sister of Milcah, sister of Lot, niece and wife of Abraham. In the ancient Near East, the family delineations were not near as tightly defined as they are today. It was all too common for the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of a person to refer to someone who is several generations separated from them as simply father. For example, in Genesis 14.6, Lot is called Abraham's brother, and yet we know from the above verse that Lot was truly Abraham's nephew, according to our reckoning. And Genesis 14.6 says, So he brought back all the goods, and he brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. The name Sarai is then thought to be a nickname given to Yiska. Milka means queen, and so Yiska, the younger sister, was then potentially nicknamed my princess by her husband, or even by her father before his death. Is this true? Well, we can't know for sure, but this sits easier with me than that Sarah is Abraham's niece rather than his half-sister. It's easier for me to believe that I simply don't understand the specifics of the family dynamics in the ancient Near East. After all, Abraham's brother Nahor married Milka. It would make sense for Abraham to marry Yiska. And if Sarah is in fact Yiska, this would mean that her father died before his father. This would leave the children of that father in a state of shame, namely Milka and Yiska. 
An early death was seen as a curse in ancient cultures. They were seen as the gods judging the one who had died. And perhaps Abraham's marriage to Sarah and Nahor's marriage to Milcah was a way of protecting her from the prospect of finding a husband without a father, without a family to pay the dowry or to arrange some sort of beneficial match. I, I can't stress enough right now that I'm only speculating based off of the potential that Rashi brings up that Yiska is in fact Sarah. Regardless of the exact family tree of the family of Abraham, we do know that Sarai grew up in the same household and that she was 10 years Abraham's junior. That we know for sure. So when Abraham leaves his family in Genesis 12, we read that Lot tags along as well. But Sarah, Sarah is also there, in which we are not specifically told. And when they get to Canaan, there's a famine, and so they move to Egypt. And when they get to Egypt, we find the first incident of Sarai being taken into the household of another man. And this would have brought shame upon Sarai to be taken from her husband and put into the harem of another man. But things work out for Abraham, though. The king releases Sarai, and they return to Canaan. And Abraham has his honor returned. But what about Sarai? Her husband had allowed her to be taken into the house of another man. If God had not intervened, things would have turned out drastically differently. For three chapters, then, we hear nothing of Sarah as Abraham and Lot split, and Abraham chases down and defeats the four kings that had taken Lot captive. And then God creates his one-way covenant with Abraham that he will bless Abraham with children and give them the land of Canaan. Just not yet. It's not until chapter 16, after this promise had been given, that we see Sarai appear in the narrative. And once again, Sarah's shame is the focus of the chapter, because Sarah is barren. And that is a shameful state of affairs, even today, but especially shameful in the ancient Near East, because it was a woman's duty to provide an heir for her husband. In the ancient Near East, in most cultures, a woman had two years after marriage to provide an heir, and if she did not within two years, she was considered barren. The husband could then divorce her and move on to someone who would give him children. So after two years, Sarah's place... As Abraham's wife, it's not very solid anymore. But God had promised that Abraham would be the father of many. And he'd even gone so far as to cut a covenant with her husband in order to seal this deal. Sarah, however, lives in constant shame, though, because of her dead womb. She knows that she's not capable of being the one through whom this blessing is to come. After all, who is she? How hard it must have been for Sarah. Previously, her husband had given her to another man in Egypt, and now the only option that she saw that was available to her was to give her Egyptian maid to her husband. When Sarai gave Hagar to Abraham in Genesis 16, she was simply doing what society demanded of her. She was giving her husband an heir through the culturally accepted method of doing so. Because God had promised an heir, and that was simply how it was done if you were barren. Can we perhaps see her in our mind now? Can we feel a bit of her pain as she cried herself to sleep, knowing that her own handmaid was going to be the one to gain the honor of the mother of nations? That was how it was done, though. What other option did she have? She wasn't part of her promise. That was her husband's promise. And then shame upon shame, when her servant begins to look down upon her when she conceives, when her servant begins to hold Sarah's shame and her own honor over Sarah's head. She reacts as anyone would when confronted with a subordinate who has stepped beyond her station. Her husband won't take sides, though. He won't tell Hagar to cool it. He leaves it to her to deal with her servant. He is to be her protector. Does he even desire her anymore? Now that he has been in the arms of this other woman, this younger woman, in the next chapter, in chapter 17, Sarai has her name changed from Sarai to Sarah. No longer is Sarai simply the princess to Abraham alone. She is renamed as a legitimate princess, the princess of many. Add to this that God has promised now that she will be a mother. What? It's been 13 years since she gave her husband a child, since she did what she had to. And now God is saying that she herself is going to bear a son? Now? Now God promises that she'll bear a son? She didn't have to give her husband away? That entire episode need not have happened? 
Regardless, not only is she barren, but now she's too old. I mean, she had faith, but faith has limits, right? Who was she that God would do this for her? That he would change the very course of nature, overcoming not just one, but two conditions that are insurmountable. Did she see this promise of a child as some sort of platitude? She'd been suffering the shame of barrenness her entire life. She suffered the shame of being given away, of then pushing another woman into her husband's bed. How could she regain her honor? She had none. The only honor she had at this point came from her association with her husband, because she had none in herself. Or did she perhaps see this promise as a new start, a new beginning, and for the first time Sarah was included in the promise in the covenant of Abraham? And along with that inclusion came a change of identity, a new name, a new person. We talked last week about how Isaac is a foreshadowing of Messiah. Did Sarah experience her salvation when she heard of him for the first time? A new start, a new beginning, included in the covenants of promise. She could finally make a break from the past that had held her back for so long, and she could become everything that she had hoped to be. In the very next chapter, God then comes and speaks to her husband and promises a child by the following year. Once again, we see Sarah's heart as she laughs, and we get the feeling that this is a derisive laugh. Yeah, right. Sure, I've heard this before, but there is perhaps in this laugh a bit of hope. Well, the men outside over here, and then they call her out on her disbelief. These visitors are now shaming her in front of her husband. So what? This tiny shame is perhaps something that she could handle if it means the honor of motherhood. Just after this, her husband takes off once again, this time to Philistia. And this occurs within the year between the promise and the fulfillment. And once again, she finds herself in the household in the harem of another man. Her past is not catching back up to her. She was supposed to be breaking from her past, and yet, yet here she is. Here she is playing out her past again. The old shame, the old ways of thinking, trying to claw their way back into her head. How many days did she spend in this house waiting for the moment that he would come and take her as his wife? I mean, she was no longer a young, spry 65. She was an old woman now. She was part of that covenant now, and yet here she is. How did her faith hold up in this? God promised her a son, and the next thing she knows, She's been tossed away or taken away once again. God has promised good things, but where are they? And then it happens. God finally gives her a child that she has so desperately desired. And yet, and yet, when we usually read the opening of Genesis 21, we read it as an exclamation of joy in Genesis 21.6. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and everyone who hears of it laughs with me. And it's common for English translators to steep this verse as though Sarah is rejoicing at her new child. But that's not the way that the Hebrew steeps it. In the Hebrew, this verse reads more accurately, And Sarah said, Laughter is made towards me, God, and all the hairs will laugh towards me. It's very easy for the Hebrew to say, With me. That's a Beit Cholam. And that is not what it says, though. It says, Lamed Cholam. It says, Towards me. Not with me. It's as if Sarah is not really rejoicing. Oh sure, the thing that she's been hoping for for so long, or her deepest desire has been granted. The impossible that she had given up on so long ago was, an, was now reality, and that reality was beginning to settle in as she felt life begin to move in her womb. She'd been burned too many times though by reality. Reality had not been kind to her up to this point, and even now, how much of a blessing was this truly? I'm 90 now, and now I have a child. I'm going to be the laughing stock. God has made me a mockery. I should be retiring in my dotage, and my grandchildren should be adults and caring for me. And yet here I am, only now giving birth to my first child. I find it more likely, and rather than laughing at joy at the birth of her child, Sarah once again felt disenfranchised. What should be her honor? Still tinged with shame. Then that half-breed firstborn son begins to mock her son, her son, and she will not allow that to happen. Ishmael is bringing her worst fears to life, and the path of her life is now being visited 
upon her son. This must stop. The Egyptian woman and her son must go. They're no longer needed anyway. Avraham has an heir now. He has her son. Her new identity and her honor are being dragged back into shame. And then, horror, horror upon shame. God asks for Isaac to be sacrificed to him. Her blessed son dead. Her one consolation, her baby boy, the answer to a million prayers is to be slain. And not just slain, but slain by his father as a sacrifice. In many Jewish commentaries, Sarah dies at this point in the story because of her worry for her son, and the fear that she will never see him again eats her alive. The life of Sarah was not an easy life, living in the shadow of such a great man, and yet never good enough, never feeling like she was what Abraham deserved. She was simply what Abraham was stuck with, because he was a kind man, and the thought running forever through her mind that if Abraham had it all to do over again, would he still choose her? And so Sarah passes. Did she know that Isaac survived? Did she get to see him once again before she passed? Her hard life comes to an end, a life of shame and disappointment, a life where blessing is turned to horror, a life where honor is bestowed, but it's too little, too late. A life in the background, never enough, never capable of being what those around her need her to be always the one to be shuffled off on others, always the one that takes a backseat to others, always forced to do the distasteful thing for the sake of optics. How many of us live our lives with similar thoughts? How many women, how many lives live in this place constantly? I know for a fact that my own wife lived with similar thoughts for a very long time, and my own actions did nothing to help her see her worth. She lived in constant pain, not able to do the things that were expected of her, not able to live up to not just what others wanted of her, but not even capable of living up to her own expectations of herself. She lived with a husband who would more often than not choose to stare at a screen than to be with her. A husband who was successful in his professional life and she was not able to help in any way. In fact, she was holding him back. She was holding the entire family back. He was capable, and any help that she offered was shrugged off or never really good enough. And my wife lived with shame for decades. Shame in herself, in her own faults, in her failures of never being enough. Constantly berating herself, constantly blaming herself. Never enough. Never good enough. Was she right, though? Let's return to Sarah. Was Sarah's view of herself and her life as I painted it, is it accurate? Did her husband honor her? Did her neighbors? Was she what her husband needed? Well, this chapter reveals an interesting story, and it's something that Sarah herself might have been surprised to learn if she had been alive to witness the events that are recorded here. This chapter on the surface seems to be pretty straightforward, but there are a few things going on here that reveal the truth of how Avraham viewed Sarah and how the world viewed Sarah. Sarah died, and the first thing that we read is that Avraham mourns and he weeps for her. That's to be expected. A husband is to mourn when his wife passes. But the next thing he does is he goes in search of a burial place for her. Again, nothing out of place. She needs a place to be planted somewhere. He approaches the natives of the land, and he begins to plea by debasing himself by acknowledging his place without honor among them, by saying, I am a foreigner and I am a stranger among you. In essence, he's saying, I have no right to even ask this. It's not my place, but I am stepping out of my place for a moment, because my bride is worth it. And what was the response of those living in the land? You are a prince of God among us. The men of Hebron recognized that Abraham was honored by God and that Avraham had the favor of God. But how do they choose to do so? Ask this. Do they recognize Avraham as the father of many, or even as the father of one? No. They recognize Avraham's position as a prince of God. They recognize Avraham's position in relationship to his wife. 
because Sarah, Sarah was princess. That's her name. And Abraham then is, of course, a prince if he is married to princess of many. And so they call him a prince of God. These men likely would not have known Sarah's own shame. And they would simply have known the miracle that had been accomplished through her. A son at such an old age, miraculous. The wife of such a wealthy and honorable man, truly a princess who has been blessed by God. They don't know anything of Egypt. They don't know anything of Gerar and Avimelech. They know nothing of Hagar and Ishmael. They know Abraham, a great man with a beautiful wife who was fruitful way past the time of fruitfulness. And they identify Abraham as blessed because of Sarah. She was the princess. And that obviously makes him the prince. Abraham then asks for a piece of land. And the owner offers to give the land to Abraham. And we don't recognize it as such, but this offer contains with it some strings. In the ancient Near East, if something was given as a gift, that gift would then pass back into the hands of the giver upon the death of the receiver. Abraham knew this. We don't. Abraham wasn't simply looking for a place to bury Sarah. He was looking for a place to honor Sarah, a monument to his wife, without whom the covenant that God had made to him would never have been possible. Abraham then makes clear that he is wishing to pay for the property. He makes clear that he wants it as a property and as a burial site. So Ephron names a price and Abraham agrees. And to our Western minds, this is nothing. And of course, Abraham paid the price that was named. In the Middle East, though, that was unheard of. In the Middle East, in the ancient Near East, haggling is the way of life. What Abraham does here is quite shocking. When two parties would enter into negotiations for anything, whether it be a piece of cloth, an apple, or a stretch of land, the seller would first present a price that was extravagant, much more than the item's worth. The buyer would then respond with a price as well under the actual value, and the haggling would begin, and eventually a price would be agreed upon. Usually in this arrangement, one party would claim to have been cheated and, and or robbed in the exchange. Once again, this would cause a problem in the future. There would at some point in the future be a claim of theft from one party to the other. And Abraham forestalls this from possibly happening by simply agreeing to pay the initial inflated price. If the initial price is paid, the seller cannot ever claim to have been cheated. Alternatively, Abraham's actions in this instance would also have brought shame upon him. To simply agree to the original price? Unheard of. What kind of imbecile does this? Only someone who does not have any honor would do such a thing. And yet they had just declared Abraham's honor. He is a prince of God, and then he acts as if he had no honor. What a scandal! But what was Avraham's perspective in this? The future honor of his bride, even in her death, was worth more to him than his own honor in his life. The problem with this narrative? We aren't told this, but once again, I think that the silence on the subject speaks volumes. Avraham didn't show Sarah how much he honored and loved her while she still lived. And that's something that's all too common in our world. We treat people as if they'll be with us forever. We take advantage and we take for granted. And this is one of the great tragedies of our world. Sarah lived in shame the majority of her life and her husband added to it without knowing. And yet those around her thought very highly of her. And this is a state of life for too many people. We all live in shame of one thing or another. Some situation, event, or a way that you reacted to the things around you. That internal shame that we carry with us. And as is all too common, women tend to do this more than men. Too often women carry around shame, feelings of inadequacy, self-loathing, and the men in their lives don't recognize it, or if they do, don't do anything to change it. In fact, us husbands, we usually add to it without realizing it. And this leads to many feeling as though they're not able to be used by God. Why would God want to use a person like me? What use could I be? And then mental patterns begin to form and inadequacy becomes a way of life. Constantly suffering. Never enough. Never enough. Eaten by fear. Consumed by expectations. Guilt. Shame. 
swallowing us all whole. And what can overcome this? Only one thing. A new identity. An identity found in the promise and the covenant of Abraham. A break from the old. My wife, Rebecca, was for the majority of her life known as Becky. Becky was sick. Becky was never enough. Becky was racked with shame. And so, there came a point where we decided that she would no longer go by Becky, but she would go by Rebecca. Now Rebecca, Rebecca was never sick. Rebecca was a new creation. The change in identity, which became real for Rebecca, is one that everyone who enters into the covenant with Yeshua can experience. Our past, our shame, our ways of thought, they can all be buried conceptually with an old identity. And yet, and yet our past will invariably catch up to us. We will find ourselves in situations that are all too similar to the ones that have come before. Because a new identity cannot change our circumstances. It can, however, change our reactions to these old, shameful situations. The past will still exist. The mistakes that you have made will still have a place in your life. Sarah still found herself in the harem of a foreign king. Sarah still had her mistake with Hagar surrounding her and bringing her shame. Did she react differently? The thing that ends up bringing us the most honor, our relationship to Yeshua, also brings us a mixture of honor and shame from among those of the nations. Which will we focus on? What will we make our truth? The fact of the matter is that while this is the way of the things of the world, while we may never find ourselves honored by those who love us, we will never see ourselves through the eyes of another. All we can know is that our relationship to Yeshua is where we can always find honor. Our lives may be defined by shame, but when we trust in Yeshua, when we're in covenant with Him, we simply cannot be defined by shame. It has no control over us. Yeshua offers the opportunity to start over, to become a new creation, and that is found only in our new identity as being a member of the covenant. If you are listening to this today and you are weighed down by shame and guilt, if you're weighed down by your past, you don't have to be. You can be in covenant with Messiah, and if you're in covenant with Messiah, that entitles you to a new identity that allows you to start over. Sarah likely did not know how much those around her thought of her. She probably died without ever knowing how much she was respected, as she was wrapped up in her own interpretation of the events that were going on around her. She was given the chance, though. She was given an opportunity to overcome her past. What did she do? We don't really know. We can guess, and we can come up with several different options each of which can really speak to us. But that's not really the question what Sarah did. What's the question? The question is, what will you do? What will you do? You've been given an opportunity to overcome your past, to change it, to react in a new way, and to be a new person. You have that opportunity now. You can live that out into the world. Yeshua steeps his message in being born again. That being born again is that taking on of a new identity, starting over fresh, discarding the past modes of thought, discarding the past shames, discarding your past sins, and being a brand new person. Unfortunately, our flesh and our history doesn't catch up with us or doesn't change in that moment, but we can. We can change how we react in that moment. We can change what we feel in that moment. We can, in truth, start over. Start over new. Start over fresh. You don't have to live in shame. If you are a servant of Yeshua, if you are in covenant with the God of Israel, just like my wife, just like Sarah, just like Abraham, and just like so many others. You have a new identity. You're given a new name. 
live in that new name. Discard the old. Discard that old manner of living, that old manner of interacting with the world. You see, in the ancient Near East, in the Hebrew, the word name doesn't simply mean what a person is called. It doesn't mean their moniker or the series of syllables that are added together to create what they answer to. A name is a reputation. A name is a person's honor. A name is a person's authority. It's their everything that defines them and everything that identifies them from another person. Even if your moniker doesn't change what people call you, you have a new name. You have a new honor. You have a new authority. You have a new responsibility. You are a new creation. So let's realize that. Let's actually live that out and realize that in our world. Let's rejoice that we are a new creation, that God has given life to us. Because once you're his, you're immortal. Did you realize that? You are immortal. Will your flesh pass away? Yes. Will you pass away? Nope. Whether you go to heaven or whether you sleep in the ground until the resurrection, you're not dead. None of us are dead. You've been given new life. And so part of seeking that new life is living in that new identity. Accepting that new identity and using it as the impetus to change. And in that new identity, with that new authority and with that new spirit, you can. With God's help. With God's help, you can derash chai. You too can seek life. Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Deresh Chai. If you would like to find out more or support this ministry, head over to SeekLifeSC.com. That's SeekLifeSC.com. We'll see you again next time as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Shalom.